On behalf of Mary Jane, Chris, and Stephanie, and the entire family, they would like you to know uh, that they are blessed beyond measure by your presence here this afternoon as we remember and celebrate uh, Jim's life and love. Thank you for taking time out of your busy schedules to come alongside the family as they uh, mourn their separation by his loss yet. And here's the important part, Mary Jane, they celebrate his presence. His present presence before his Savior and Lord. As we begin our time this afternoon, uh, listen to this promise. Listen to this promise to Jim from Jesus himself. I want us to think about the scripture from that, that perspective. Listen to this promise to Jim from Jesus himself out of John's Gospel, chapter 14. We read these words, Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. But I go to prepare, I would not have told you, but I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, for you I will come again and will take you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. And then the doubting disciple Thomas said to him, How do we know the way, Lord? And Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one. No one comes to the Father but through me. Let's pray together as we begin our time to celebrate Jim and his, his new eternal dwelling place, because that's what Jesus promised him. Let's pray. God, I thank you for our time to gather with friends and family. I pray, Father God, that you, Lord, would be lifted up as we testify to Jesus, to, about Jesus' life in Jim. May, Lord, you receive all the glory as we express our love to you for the love that Jim had for you. We ask your blessing upon our time in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm a bit of an old-fashioned guy, believe it or not. I, uh, um, I like doing things formally. I know some of you might not think I do it that way, but I, I do like to do some things formal, and one of the formal things I like to do is read the obituary um, in settings like this. Listen, to these words about Jim's life. Jim, James K. Jim Russell, Horseheads, New York, age 76. Passed away on Thursday, February 1st, 2024, at his home surrounded by his loving family. Born on January 23rd in 1948 in Canton, Pennsylvania, son of the late Kenneth and Doris Austin Russell. Jim was a graduate of Southside High School. He married his best friend and companion, Mary Jane Paul, on November 30th, 1979. By the way, if I did the calculations right, that's 44 years together, Mary Jane. What a tremendous testimony. A tremendous testimony. In earlier years, Jim was an active member of the Southside Baptist Church and taught Sunday school. He was a church trustee and deacon. In later years, he was an active member serving in multiple roles at Maranatha Bible Chapel and is fondly remembered as a church greeter. Jim was a very welcoming and loving man, a man who never met a stranger. An avid sports fan, he was active throughout the years coaching and mentoring youth. In addition to his loving wife, Mary Jane, Jim is survived by his two children, Christopher Russell, yeah, Forsheads, Stephanie and Jonathan Goodwin Russell of Big Flats, three grandchildren, Riley Goodwin, Aubrey and Noah Russell, six siblings, Judy and Kurt Dickerson, Sandy and Dan Vineyard, Pat and Van and Gillett, Carol Jividen, Richard and Pam Russell, 
and Janet Beerline, several nieces, nephews, cousins, and many close family and friends. In addition to his parents, Jim was predeceased by his brothers, two brothers-in-law, Gary Jividin and Joseph Beerline. Stand with me this afternoon as Bob comes to lead us in our first worship song. And after we have concluded that song, we'll have a time of sharing remembrances from family and friends. So if you'd like to share something, please be considering what you might share after we sing. So let's stand together. Noah, Jim's grandson, is going to come and, and uh, uh, give uh, some words. I'll give you a microphone, Noah, so they can hear you. All right? There you go, buddy. Hi, I'm uh, my grandpa's grandson, Noah. So I'm just going to start off with the definition of grandfather. Grandfather, the father of one's mother, father or mother, also a term of respectful familiarity, familiarity and foundation setter of the family that he will soon raise. Grandpa wasn't really the talkative type, but he didn't have to be the talkative type. He showed everything just by his eyes and attitude. He always expressed his feelings in the best way possible, and he always loved the ones around him. He, showed, he was always there for anyone and kept other people's chins held up high. He, will always keep, he always kept a smile on his face, even through the thick and thin. He always put a smile on his friends' and family's faces, too. As he looks down on us, watching us grow, watching us mature into our future selves, I'm sure he doesn't want people crying over his death, but celebrating that he's moved on to a better place. A better place where he can run free and worship the Lord every day. And just know he's no longer suffering from pain, paralysis, and being uncomfortable. He was set free, but he is always a teacher too. Always taught us important lessons that would soon help us in our daily lives. For example, he taught us to cherish the ones around us because we don't know how much time we have with them. Such an important lesson, but some people still choose to ignore the ones they were supposed to cherish. The accomplishments that he has made is too long of a list to say, but one of his accomplishments is the family that he has raised. He's raised the best family to ever exist. And his friends, he's raised up, raised up from off the ground. He's helped me a lot, but he doesn't brag about it. And I'm sure if he's helped you guys a lot too. He also doesn't brag about it because he was never the uh, bragging kind of guy. He left all of, all of his accomplishments down here for us to cherish. So when you look at one another and say to them, he left such a great gift, he has helped us all. You might be thinking, well... He, has, he only left his children his marriage as an accomplishment? No, he's helped us all. Even if some of the people there here are friends, he has still helped us, and you might just not think that now. Um, so I'm going to end off with, thanks, Grandpa. Thanks, Noah. Thank you. When I met with Mary Jane, we talked about offering opportunity for you to give testimony. So if you would like to, I will pass you the microphone so we can hear. So if you'd like to give testimony, please just indicate and we'll bring you a microphone. I'm going to try. I, don't know if I, can. I understand that. Jim was more than a, a brother to me. He was one of my best friends growing up. <laughs> And he, he coached my basketball team and, and, and softball team. And he was always there to, to, to cheer his family on and just be with him. Good adventure, Jim. Love you. Amen. say because of the church that Jim and my husband Roger we had a lady on Sunday who came to Mary Jane and I and she said I'm so sorry about Jim and then I didn't know your husband gone too she said they were the first two people that greeted us when we walked in the church and there was never a Sunday that they did not 
shake our hands and let us know they loved us. And you know, this is a great loss because Jim was so burdened for our church and wanting to see people love God and what a special relationship that each one in his life he's touched has been unspeakable. We didn't know Jim very long, but I'll never forget the first time that I met him. We came to visit. Our daughter was helping with the song music, musical program, and we were taking care of the kids while she did that. And there were Roger and Jim going up and down the aisle, speaking to everyone, making them feel welcomed. And I thought to myself, if God ever brought me to another church from where I was going, this probably would be the one. Lo and behold, here we are, moved to Horseheads. And there was Jim. And there was Roger still doing it, loving God, loving the people, loving church, and making everyone feel so welcomed. And I know he's, they're doing the same thing. Once in a while, we went out to dinner with them. Love the bantering back and forth that Roger and Jim did. And Rod, once in a while, pulling in everything that they accomplished and did around the church building that maybe nobody else knew and noticed, but it was very obvious. So I know, just like Pastor Sam said Sunday, Jim loved God. He loved his church, and he loved his people. Probably on the more humorous side, uh, I knew Jim from riding lawn tractors. He used to cut the back eight to ten acres, and even when he wasn't feeling well, he'd get out there and do it. And he was a great encouragement. Rod Kerr the same way. I know Rod's here. He would speak the same. When I played, continued to play softball, Jim and Dave Westlake would show up at the ball games. I had no business as an old man being out there, but they probably had no business sitting on the stands either. But they came. Jim was a giving person. On the humorous side, he never found something that two other people other than himself couldn't do. I don't know how well you knew Jim, but he could always come up with an answer for something, but somehow it didn't involve him. For that reason, I kind of named him WD-40 or 10W-30 because he was really slippery. <laughs> he would show up at shuffleboard. Sometimes he could play, sometimes he couldn't, but he was always there for fellowship, always there to lead in prayer, always there to sing hymns with us and praise the Lord. What a great testimony, great testimony of his life and of his family. And I praise God for Jim's life. <laughs> yep. Well, I think Jim and Roger both. Faye and I are largely here because of, of their 
love that they showed and the way they loved the church. And uh, it was a pleasure to cut grass with that man. For, for seven years, we cut them 50 to 20 acres out there. Some days it seemed like 50, but, uh, but it didn't matter how hot it was. He put in the time, but he's in a better place now. Um, I wanted to speak for Janet, who's not here. Um, she's in Florida and wasn't able to get here. Um, she said that that Jim was a blessing for her when her husband, uh, Joe, was uh, terminally ill with cancer. Uh, he helped a lot for Joe. And then also, at the same time, the kids were living with Rich and I. And every day she came during the week and came and got the littlest ones, Jacob, who was two, and Zach, uh, Tyler, who was four. Um, she came and got them from our house and took them up to the babysitters, uh, which was Amy, um, who now is married into the family. Um, and she, he took them up there every single day for me so that I could then go on to work and if he hadn't done that every day, I don't know what I would have done. But he helped out uh, in other ways as well for Joe. So Janet said that he was such a blessing for her, and she uh, wanted people to know about that. And also, um, in the last couple of years, uh, we, as a group, um, Pat and Van, Rich and I, Mary Jane and Jim, um, would get together to go out to dinner, or uh, they would come to our house, and we would play dominoes. And... Um, Jim was, always had some uh, jokes and comments, and I just remember the last time we played dominoes was January uh, 6th, and he, uh, he lost big time on one of them, and he had a whole bunch of dominoes and a whole bunch of points, and you're supposed to add them up yourself and tell, us, tell uh, Van how many there were, and he looked at them all, and he just took them, and he shoved them over to Mary Jane, and he said, too many. And he just came to Mary Jane and said, you got to <laughs> kind of like she had to add him up. So he was making us laugh even then. Um, so he will be greatly missed. If I could carry a tune, I would sing a song that I always think of when I think of Jim, because almost every time he'd say, Bill, the trumpet's going to sound soon. And for, for Jim, as sounded this past week, he's with the Lord now. And uh, I guess one of my favorite sayings is this, and I can only modify it today. I'm going to say Jim again. May not be here. It may not be in the air, but it will surely be there because of Jim's faith in Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior. The trumpet will sound one day, perhaps for us individually or together. What a wonderful, glorious time that is going to be. Thank you. I don't have too much, but uh, I did know Jim, or, uh, Jim at, and his family at Southside, and his uh, Mary Jane's parents, and the Russell uh, Russells too. And uh, it, I don't know if he's a greeter, but he did greet everyone with a smile, like it's up in the car. His rich when the his picture there. He greeted everyone uh, each Sunday, uh, 
and he was very friendly, and he cons uh, they comforted me when and I lost my job one time, and they both Mary Jane and Jim comforted me, but one uh, I didn't see him too much after uh, he left Southside, but I used to see him. He'd be driving uh, working for the water board, and he he driving a. a I don't know, a van full of workers somewhere. He always waved, and the workers would wave too uh, at me. I've seen him a couple, a couple times like that. He was a great guy, easy going, laid back. Uh, I, I will miss him. I'll miss him. Thank you. So my wife and my relationship go back uh, with Jim and Mary Jane and the family um, probably more than 25 years ago. Um, I didn't do the actual calculation, but um, I was brought on staff here at the church as a bivocational part-time youth pastor. And I had uh, Chris and Stephanie in our youth group together. We And... Uh, uh, our relationship goes back that far. And uh, Jim served in a number of positions um, here at the church. Um, he was a trustee, a head trustee. He was on the governing board back when we had a dual board system uh, in the church. Um, he was a deacon. He was an elder. And he was a greeter. Now, I left the greeter as last on purpose because Jim had a twisted way of greeting you. He would walk up to you on Sunday morning, and he would shake your hand, but he would do this right at the last moment. And it would completely confuse you of what you were supposed to do with Jim greeting you. And uh, I, I want to let you know that all of my kids benefited from Jim's twisted greeting. Uh, every one of them knew Jim, and... Uh, um, and they appreciated, just like the testimonies you've heard this morning, they appreciated that someone came up to them on Sunday morning and acknowledged them. They weren't just a body. They were, someone reached out and cared for them, and Jim Jim did that. Jim joined me on Tuesday mornings for men's prayer. Now, uh, I put men's prayer in, uh, in my office, and the time frame wasn't the greatest in the world for having people get up because it was usually about 5.15 it started in the morning. I'm an early riser, an early guy. And so Jim participated in our prayer meeting every Tuesday for as long as he could. He got to a point where he wasn't driving any longer, and um, he had to stop. But in that prayer meeting, we have four or five guys every Tuesday morning, and Jim was faithful, faithful to that uh, prayer time. I love the role. I was honored when Mary Jane uh, called me uh, last week. Um, she called me on, I believe she called on Thursday, the day Jim passed, and talked to me about doing the service for him. And I was able to go down to the house and pray with Jim before he passed and uh, meet with the family. And I was, I'm honored that Mary Jane asked me uh, to do the service uh, today. And I have, I love the role that I have in the service today. And that is I get to tell you about my friend's faith. Because Jim was a good friend of mine. All the years that I was here. All the years that, and the roles that I played here at the church. He was friends with my wife and my kids. We have the most, we have the most important event in history recorded for us in John chapter 20. It's the most important event in history in the gospel of John chapter 20. Every one of us, including Jim, has to wrestle with the content of John chapter 20. 
The event, in my opinion, is the pivotal event of history. Every living person has to come to a decision with regards to it. Some of you might be familiar with the event. Some of you may not. When you leave here today, Jim would want you to be aware of the event and to make a decision about it. The backstory leading up to the event in John chapter 20 is this, that Jesus had been betrayed in the garden by one of his own, one of his disciples, and he's been arrested and he's been tried three times illegally for crimes he never committed. And he's been condemned to death to be crucified. And that's leading into the scene that we're going to come upon in John chapter 20. Now, I'm going to tell you, so I'm not going to read the story to you. I'm going to just tell you what's going on in John chapter 20. After Jesus was put to death, he was in the grave for three days. And on the first day of the week, they didn't have time on Friday to be able to wrap his, his body with the 40 pounds of, uh, of uh, potpourri that they would put the, uh, in the bodies before they put him in the grave because of the Sabbath day coming. The Jewish Sabbath was going to happen. And so they were unable to do that properly. So on the first day of the week, after Jesus had been in the tomb for three days, Mary Magdalene comes to the tomb where they had laid Jesus. And as she comes to the tomb, she realizes the stone is rolled away from the front of the tomb. It was under the guard of the Romans, and the stone's missing. And she looks inside, and she sees two angels. She doesn't, she's beside herself. She doesn't know what to do. She's come to the grave uh, to put the spices in Jesus' grave clothes. And so what she does, because back then they didn't, they didn't believe women's testimony, what she does is she runs to the disciples and she runs to Peter, who's the leader of the disciples, and she tells Peter and the other disciples that are there with him that Jesus is gone. He's not in the tomb. And two of the disciples, John and Peter, begin running there. And John, well, doing a little bit of bragging, he beats Peter to the grave. And he won't go inside because Peter's the leader. So he waits for Peter. And then Peter looks in. And what they see and described for us there in the scriptures is that the grave clothes are laying in the shape of the body of Jesus. Now, that's important for us to note because back then they would wrap you with cloth and it was thin cloth. They'd wrap you like a mummy. And if somebody escaped from that, it would have been laying wadded up on the floor. But instead, it's laying in the shape of the person on the stone where they were laid to rest. That means Jesus passed through it. And the head cloth that was on his head, the burial cloth that was on his head, has been removed. And they folded that. It was folded up and setting in a different spot. That's the evidence that we see in the tomb. And to be honest with you, Peter doesn't know what to do with it. He leaves and goes back to his home because he doesn't know where Jesus is. John, the scriptures record for us, immediate, immediately believes because he believed the word from Jesus that he had to die and be resurrected. And so the disciples leave and Mary steps back into the tomb and she sees the angels. One sitting at the feet and one sitting at the head. And she's crying, she's weeping. And one of the angels says to her, why do you cry, woman? Why do you cry? And she says, because they've taken my Lord and I don't know where he is. And she turns around and there's somebody standing right behind her. And she thinks it's the gardener. She doesn't recognize the person. And she's crying, and the gardener asks her, why are you crying? And she says, because they've taken my Lord, and I don't know where they put him. And 
And she asks, do you know? And the gardener says to Mary, Mary, he calls her by name, just like Jim would call you by name. He calls her by name and immediately Mary recognizes it's Jesus. It's the resurrected Lord. And she's having an engagement with him. He's not dead. He's alive. And he sends her on a mission, go tell the disciples. And so she goes. And the disciples are gathered in the upper room. They're scared because they think they're next because they had crucified, they, they crucified Jesus. And the disciples are saying, well, we must be next. So they're, they're keeping hidden and they're staying out of sight. And they're locked up all together in the upper room. And all of a sudden, Jesus is in front of them. Nobody opened the door. By the way, that's pretty cool. I just want to let you know. Just like he passed through grave clothes, he just passed through the door. And he shows himself to the disciples. Now you can imagine, how'd you like to be in that room? I'd love to be there. It's great that we have the scriptures because they take us there. And then about eight days later, one of the disciples who wasn't there, Thomas, Doubting Thomas, he's known that. This is why he's called Doubting Thomas. Okay? He didn't believe what they told him. He wasn't there the first time. So Jesus does it again. Pretty cool of Jesus, isn't it? They're together again like eight days later. Doors locked. And poof! Jesus. And he says to Thomas, touch the wounds. Put your hands on the wounds that they crucified me with. See the wound on my side. And then over the course of an, another several days, because Jesus was here about 40 days before he left, he shows himself to a number of people. And in one case, he shows himself to over 500. Jesus is alive. And there's no doubt. There's no doubt. Jesus is alive. I got a little excited. I had to catch up with my notes. Hope that's okay, Mary. Mary Jane. Why is it important? Why is it important? And why do we have to make a decision? about this scene. Why is that important? Earlier in John's gospel, the the writer of the gospel of John wrote these words, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That would be Jesus. And whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through him. Folks, God sent his son into this world, this broken world, this mess we're in. Yes, we're in a mess. But God sent his son into this world, not to judge the world, but to save the world. And, but there is judgment. There is eternal punishment. In fact, here's what I want to tell you this morning. You have never, Jim was a wonderful greeter. But one thing Jim understood was he never met a mere mortal. C.S. Lewis said it this way. C.S. Lewis said, There are no, listen folks, there are no ordinary people. We heard testimony to that. There's no ordinary people. You have never talked, listen, you have never talked to a mere mortal. You want to know why? We all live forever. We're all eternal beings. That's how God created us. We're all eternal beings. The Apostle Paul wrote of the negative result of, If this scene that we're talking about, if this resurrection scene that we're talking about, where Jesus wasn't in the tomb, the Apostle Paul wrote about this negative result if the resurrection in John's John's Gospel, chapter 20, is not true. Here's what he wrote. Listen to these words that the Apostle Paul wrote related to the event in John chapter 20. He said, now, if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection from the dead? 
And if there's no resurrection from the dead, then Christ wasn't raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. We are even, listen, he went on to say, we are even found to be misrepresenting God because we testified about God that he raised Christ whom he did not raise if it is true that the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, then even Christ had not been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, listen, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. Then those who have fallen asleep, by the way, that's speaking of Jim. But those who have fallen asleep in Christ have then perished. If in Christ we have hope in this, and folks, and if in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are to be pitied most. But in fact, then listen to Paul's testimony, but in fact Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep, for as by one man came death, that's Adam, and sin entered the world. That's why we are in sin. By a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, but in Christ all are made alive. But each in his own order. Christ, the first fruits, then the coming of those who belong to Christ. Then comes the end. When he delivers the kingdom of God to the Father after destroying every rule and every authority and every power. That's what happened in John chapter 20. That's what happened in John chapter 20 in the resurrection. Jesus destroyed the power of the enemy over death. Paul said, if the resurrection did not happen, then our faith is futile. The Apostle Paul wrote this in Romans chapter 3 and verse 23. He said, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That included him, the Apostle Paul, and by the way, that included Jim. Includes me. He went on to write, the Apostle Paul went on to write, for the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Our sin, John's sin, the Apostle Paul's sin, Jim Russell's sin, caused both a spiritual death and a physical death. But because Jesus was sinless, he paid the penalty for that. And that was Jim's faith. He believed that. And then... Jim did what, what else the Apostle Paul wrote about in Romans. He said this, that if we confess with our mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, we will be saved. We're rescued. Eternally rescued. So there we're not an eternal punishment, but we're eternally with Jesus. When we reach out and we take hold of Christ, confessing our sins and believing in him, that God raised him from the dead, and that God accepted his sacrifice as just payment for your sin and mine, we're saved and we live eternally. That, folks, I just want to let you know, is Jim's present reality. Amen? That is my friend's present reality. He's present before his Savior and Lord. Let me ask you this question. See, because I really believe that Jim would want me to ask this question of you today. Have you believed and confessed your sin so that you have an eternal home in heaven alongside of Jim? You can be condo mates. I just want to let you know. And trust me, the condo is going to be better than anything you can have here. Okay? Mine's a log cabin. I forego the condo. I told Jesus a while ago, I want the log cabin in the woods.
Have you believed? Have you made a decision regarding John chapter 20? When I met with Mary Jane, and she requested that I share with you today, that's, I was, I've been reading through the New Testament, and I happened to be, literally the day that Mary Jane was calling me, I was reading John chapter 20. And when she asked me, that became the scripture for today. That's the way Jesus works, by the way. Have you made a decision regarding the resurrection? Have you dealt with John chapter 20? Because the Lord was not in the tomb. He was there with Mary after the resurrection. Jim, my friend Jim, completed his journey home last Thursday at around 9.30 when I received a text from Mary Jane. The Apostle Paul spoke of his journey home when he wrote these words to the church at Corinth. He said, for we know that if this earthly tent... That's the one that Jim was living in for 76 years. We know that if this earthly tent, which is our house, is torn down, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For indeed, in this house we groan. By the way, Jim was groaning, struggling with Parkinson's and hearing and deteriorating health. For indeed, in this house we groan longing, but that's what he was doing. He was longing to be clothed with our dwelling from heaven. I cannot think of a better way to describe Jim's faith this afternoon. He was groaning and longing to be clothed with his dwelling place in heaven, his new tent. Listen, folks, a body free from Parkinson's disease, a body free from the loss of hearing issues, a body now present eternally with his Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And I want to let you know that his journey home didn't begin with his frail body. It didn't begin with Parkinson's disease. It didn't begin with hearing loss. His journey home began and was complete when he confessed his sin and he asked Jesus to forgive him of his sin and believed in him. The one who died and was reconciled and, and was resurrected and Jim was reconciled with God. And I just want to let you know, from that point on, Jim was just traveling through this life. <laughs> Making people smile. That's what he was doing. He was just traveling through this life in this temporary home until he arrived in his eternal home with Jesus that he was promised. I mentioned that at the beginning when we opened up with Scripture. Scripture. And I want to tell you this, because I know Jim is my friend, I want to tell you this, that Jim's goal while he was here in this temp temporary life was to demonstrate his faith so that as many as possible could find their eternal home by confessing sin and believing in the one who was resurrected. I'm confident, listen folks, I can tell you this, I'm confident that Jim is in his eternal home, the one Jesus prepared for him. I'm also confident that he has a new body free from pain and any other afflictions. We're promised that in Revelation chapter 21. He will wipe away every tear from their eye and there will be no longer any death. There will be no longer any mourning or crying or pain. Amen. Amen. Jim has been promoted to his eternal home, and he would want you to know, he would want to know, if he was here right now, present with us, he would want to know that you are headed to your eternal home with him. He would want to know that you've confessed your sins and you believed in Jesus' death and resurrection. Because of my friendship with Jim, I know that he would be pleased if I asked this question, do you have such faith? He'd be happy for me to ask that question. 
to his friends and family. Do you have such faith? Have you confessed your sin and asked God to forgive your sin and believe in his son's death and resurrection as the just penalty for your sin? (laughs) There's another thing that my friend Jim loved to do or talk to me about on Sunday. He would come up to me after a morning service and and preaching and, and, and connection with people in the sermon and like that. And Jim loved that. Some of you might not know what this is. I'll explain it a little bit. But Jim loved altar calls. Jim would come up to me after the service, especially if I had an altar call and I'd be getting a pat. I knew that I'd get a pat on the back from Jim if I had an altar call and called people to the altar to respond to the message that was preached. Jim would sit back in the pew. I think it was row three, seat one. Mary Jane, I got to do this. This is not in my notes. Uh, This is Jim. Row three, seat one. One thing I will tell you is he never fell asleep. I have a number of those people who sit in row five, seat two, and ten, and seat four. They do fall asleep. Jim didn't do that. Jim paid attention the whole time. And if I had an altar call, Jim would be totally jacked up about an altar call. And he would come and see me. Thank you, he'd say. Thank you for doing that. Because you know why? Jim loved to see people at the altar up here up front pouring out their burdens before God. Some weeping because family members didn't know Jesus and weren't saved. Some weeping because family physical problems and the loss of people, maybe, who died unexpectedly. Jim would want to see people engage with God here at the altar. So here's what I'm going to tell you. I'm going to conclude. I, I'm sorry if I went too long, Mary Jane. I'm, it's what the Lord put on my heart. Here's what I'm going to do. We're going to close in prayer, but here's the deal. I'm going to have an altar call. Does Jim would want that? Now, you don't have to get out of your seat. We can do an altar call right where you're at, but I am going to ask you this question. Have you wrestled with John chapter 20? The tomb was empty. Jesus is alive. He conquered death. And your wrestle with John chapter 20 is an eternal wrestle, whether you'll spend eternity with Jesus or you'll spend eternity in judgment because judgment's coming. And then there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth. And so, if you would, bow your heads with me And I want to ask you this question. If you're here today and you've never asked Jesus to come into your life and forgive your sins like Jimmy did and his faithful testimony is to that. If you're here today and you've never done that and you'd like to do that, I'm just going to ask you, would you do me a favor and raise your hand so I can pray for you? That's between you and God. Let's pray together. Lord, I thank you for the time to be able to share Jimmy's faith and what he believed. I pray, Father God, that you will continue to move in the hearts of those who are here as they seek, Father God, and wrestle with the resurrection of your son, John chapter 20. I pray, Father God, that they would sense your spirit moving in their life and their call to confess and believe in Jesus, the one you sent to rescue them from eternal judgment and to bring them into eternal home with you. I ask in Jesus' name, amen. If you're here today and you're led uh, 
to share your thoughts related to that, or you have questions about that, I would encourage you to see uh, Mary Jane or myself or other family members who walk with Jesus. We've come to the end of our service today, our main service today. And having done that, I want to pronounce a blessing on you, which was uh, a typical thing that they did in the Old Testament. And I picked an Old Testament blessing that I would like to speak over you this afternoon. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance on you and give you peace. I speak that blessing over you this afternoon. Because Jim is going to be laid to rest at a later date, we've decided to do the committal service here. This portion of the service is usually done at graveside, but we've decided to do that here. Listen to these words, which I think fittingly describe my friend Jim. For I'm already being poured out as a drink offering. And the time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight. Yes, Jim, you have. I have finished the course. I have kept the faith. In the future, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all those, listen, who loved his appearing. We have gathered here to commit James K. Russell, a beloved husband, a beloved father, a beloved brother and brother-in-law, a a beloved uncle, a beloved grandfather, a beloved friend, my beloved friend. Back to the God who gave him to us these 76 years. Well done, Jimmy. Well done, good and faithful servant. Well done. I look forward to greeting you with a twisted handshake on the other side. Till then. Till then. Till then. Well done, my friend. Well done. Let's pray together, please. We now commit Jim back to you, God, the one whose voice numbered all of his days according to your word in Psalm 139, and whose voice has now called him to his heavenly home that you prepared for him. His journey is complete and has been well done. I pray, God, that you would provide comfort and grace and mercy and peace uh, to us, his family and friends who are left behind here as we mourn the absence of his physical presence in our lives. But we celebrate his presence with you. In the name of Jesus, amen. This concludes our service this afternoon. I want to thank you all again for coming to support the family. If you would like to come, the family's here up front. If you would like to come and pay final respects to the family before you leave, please come. And God bless you as you go this afternoon. Amen.